Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. I, I sense that we have the nine o'clock, like energy is slow to be circulating into our bodies. Uh, have any of you been sick recently? Any of you have joined me this week? Uh, I generally, um, I try to make it through my sicknesses without uh, drugs and other helpers, but by Wednesday night, I was beat into submission, and I asked the pharmacist if they had horse tranquilizers, and what other, other things would put me to sleep. I didn't want day quill or anything that was non-drowsy. I wanted, like, to be drugged for the next, like, four hours, four nights. Uh, and I feel that I've just kind of come out of that. If any of you have not had your early or late fall cold, uh, if you get this one, you're going to love it, I think. Uh, Shirley has uh, done a great job of kind of reminding us of where we've been over the past few weeks uh, through her prayer. Thank you, Shirley, for doing that and leading us really through the prayer of this theme verse. Uh, two weeks ago, this is how we kind of opened up uh, this series as we are considering the kind of church that God is calling us to be as we open the doors of our lives and our building to the people of Cochrane. And uh, so that, that kind of set the foundation that we believe that God has placed us in this place at this time. Not, we're not just a random collection of people that happen to be here right now, but that actually God has brought us here for a purpose, to bless uh, and to bring shalom to Cochrane, to bring the social and spiritual and physical uh, well-being of Jesus to our community. Last week, uh, we saw that in order to bring that kind of light and life to the people around us, we need to prioritize three different relationships. We use this uh, triangle that we've been looking at quite a bit this, uh, this past fall. First, we said we need to prioritize our relationship with God and pursue friendship with him. That is where uh, the spirit blesses us and enables us to be uh, light and life to the, the community around us. We also need the support of other believers, other people who are following followers of Jesus, so we need to develop real, supportive, authentic relationships with those around us. That is what the church is. And finally, uh, there is the relationship with the people around us. There are outward relationships, our call to bring the light and message of Jesus to the people and to the groups uh, of people that he has placed us among. Today, uh, I want us to, I want to call us to embrace an ancient Christian practice that has been um, one of the marks of the church, I think, for thousands of years, and yet I think because of the pace, because of the tone of our society, I believe that it is falling into neglect in the church, and that is the surprising practice of Christian hospitality. If you are a person connected to Jesus, then you are called to practice hospitality. What's more, if this building that we're in, this building that we're thinking about renovating and changing, if it is a building dedicated to the glory of Jesus Christ, then by definition, it must be a hospitable place. That is, I think, what it means to open the door, right? To open the door is to invite other people in, to welcome them, to receive them, to make them feel at home. If a person comes to your house and you don't open the door, probably you're not doing very well at being hospitable. When you think of the word hospitality, what comes to mind? I googled yesterday hospitality and saw what came up for images, and what you get is mostly a lot of images like this. When, you, when, when Google, and I don't know if Google thinks, but when it thinks about hospitality, mostly what it thinks of is an industry. The hospitality industry is a broad category of fields within the service industry that includes lodging, event planning, theme parks, transportation, cruises, tourism. For our society, increasingly, hospitality means that. When you go to a hotel, you're going to get hospitality. Hospitality is something you pay for when you go on holidays or stay at a hotel or eat at a restaurant. 
Some of you may not be thinking about that. You think about this lady, and uh, this is what we're serving at our Open the Door banquet uh, next week, and uh, Martha Stewart, maybe we could hire her to, to make whatever kind of cake that is. So some of you, when you think hospitality, it's like fancy dishes and all the Christmas decorations up and perfectly baked desserts. The thing is, when you read the word hospitality in the Bible, Martha Stewart or an industry is not exactly the concept the Bible has in mind. You can actually find biblical portraits of hospitality, surprising hospitality, from the beginning of the book to the end, really. And I tried a little exercise this week. If you're curious and uh, have nothing to do this afternoon, I challenge you to read through a gospel. Just kind of flip through Matthew or Mark or Luke or John and pay attention to how many times you come across a story of someone eating or staying at someone's house or being welcomed into a home or being not welcomed into a home. You can't even like get beyond Luke chapter one before Mary is staying at Elizabeth's house. You get to Luke chapter two. Jesus is trying to find a place to stay his first night, or his parents are. There's no room for them at the inn, so they stay not at the hospitality industry, but in a stable. Uh, So even though uh, I think that it would be very enlightening for you to consider this subject of hospitality, which is not like peripheral to scripture, I think it's central. Uh, I think you can find it all over. I want to pick one very specific text this morning to anchor our thoughts, and that is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And uh, I want to break from tradition today. I usually read uh, from the New International Version, but I think I'm going to have to do too much uh, translation to get to what the text really says. So I'm going to read from the English Standard Version this morning uh, because I think it'll get us to the point of the text quicker. Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. What you'll notice is that before the writer of Hebrews gets to the hospitality part, he starts about by talking about family relationships. He says, let brotherly love continue. Brotherly love. The Greek word that he actually uses is one that you know very well, one that we've actually studied early this year, the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a special love that binds together kids who come from the same moms and dads. In fact, before Christians like Paul started using it in a specialized way, Philadelphia was not a religious word uh, in Greek culture at all. When you described how you loved your sister because she was your sister, you would use the word Philadelphia. Philio, the word love, plus Adelphos, the word for brother, equals Philadelphia. So the scripture writers take the term that usually was for family relationships and applied it to the family of God. People related to the Father, to our Heavenly Father through faith in His Son Jesus are united together as family. And so we're called to love each other as family. And the writer of Hebrews says, let this kind of family love continue. Jesus has brought you together. You are people who know God's grace, God's love. Continue to treat each other, each other as family with that same kind of grace and love. Philadelphia should be what we experience as a church family. Friendship. Loyalty, connection, support, all of this freely given to one another because we were, when we were adopted into God's family, adopted in without any kind of merit of our own. And brotherly love, Philadelphia is not just some kind of philosophical hoity-toity idea, some kind of emotional thing. It is deeply practical. Here is the Apostle John talking about Philadelphia. This is how we know what love is, he says. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. Now, if we were to stop just with verse one of Hebrews chapter 13, we might imagine hospitality as a bunch of people who know and love each other who are helping each other out, supporting one another, and because they all like each other so much, they're probably going out for lunch and having each other over for barbecues, right? That's hospitality. Well, what's interesting is where the writer of Hebrews moves next. Verse two, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. Show hospitality to strangers is actually just one word in the original language. And the word is philo- philoxenia. Uh, the, my Greek is pretty poor. It's been like 20 years since I studied any of it. You've probably never heard of that word before, but you have heard of a related term. If I were to say the word xenophobia, any of you know what that means? Any of you uh, like Scrabble fans out there that need your X words? Phobia, of course, means fear, and xenos is the word for strangers or foreigners. So if you are a person who has an irrational fear of people who are different from other countries, who look different than you, you might say that you have xenophobia. In verse 2, the word xenos or xenia, strangers, gets combined with the word philo, the same word we got for love in Philadelphia. The new word is the Greek word for hospitality, philoxenia, love of strangers. So what we get in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 is, let Brotherly love continue, let all that good family stuff continue, and don't forget to love, to welcome the stranger either. In the space of like six Greek words, the text goes from, hey, the church is really the family of God which should come with this family dynamic where people are known and loved and cared for and served, where we're aware of each other's needs and practically meeting those needs. But as that's going on, as you're doing that stuff, don't forget to love the stranger too. Philadelphia, the love of the Christian family is an expanding, expansive kind of love. It goes beyond those you know to include those you don't know or at least those you don't know yet. You can't enjoy good Christian fellowship so much that you miss the person who is a newcomer, a foreigner, someone who isn't connected, who doesn't immediately belong. And I would suggest verse three could fill in that description. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Christian hospitality, a truly surprising hospitality, crosses barriers that other people will not cross. It breaks down barriers that often separate people from one another. It opens the doors of our lives to the stranger, the prisoner, the one with a special need, the person who's not cool, not acceptable, the person who's been forgotten or mistreated or is suffering. So, ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing as a family? How well do you love strangers? How open is your life, your home, your time to people who look or sound or act unfamiliar to you? When we say, 
with our logos and our campaigns that we want to open the door of this church building to welcome in newcomers and strangers. If we are doing all of this in part to make ourselves even more accessible to the community around us, a community that is going to grow by thousands, if not tens of thousands in the coming years, and that's thousands of strangers a year, by the way, a town that will become much more racially diverse than it is today, is our desire to be hospitable to such a community, is that aspirational? Like, is that something we would like to be in the future? Like, we hope it'll be true of us someday? Or are we already living this kind of dynamic out? My assessment would be that we do okay. Not terrible, but not awesome either. For sure, uh, there are some of us here this morning that are acutely aware of strangers. It's almost as if they see someone new, they make a beeline for that person. And I know that we are all extremely grateful for those kind of folks. But this text doesn't say, hey, those of you who like new people, be hospitable. It's a universal call to hospitality, not just for people who have a knack or a gift for it. It's not good enough for us to hope that the greeters or the friendly people will catch a stranger. We shouldn't be satisfied with the special few who know how to talk with someone who's a little different or or who has a special calling to minister to foreigners. It should be all of us, right? And nor could we say this morning that hospitality can be boiled down to meeting someone new in the foyer on Sunday and being friendly to them. When we do a handshake on Sunday morning, it is more of a symbolic gesture of hospitality, a a reminder of our need to practice hospitality, but we could hardly say, well, I, I shook somebody's hand. I didn't know. I guess I've crossed over to the hospitality zone. That's just a reminder of the kind of life we ought to be living the rest of the week. Hospitality, biblically understood, has to do with welcoming people to our tables, to our homes, including other people in our family gatherings, seeing that they find a place in our community. So, when was the last time you took someone out for coffee that hasn't been a friend of yours for years? Better yet, when did you last share a meal with somebody at your house? How long since you last broke bread with someone whose first language wasn't English? Who gets invited when you go to Starbucks or for wings? How open or closed is your small group to newcomers? I came across a quote in my study this past week that stings a little, but I think we need to hear it. It comes from a Canadian Catholic by the name of Jean Vanier. Some of you will know that Vanier is the founder of LARCH, uh, an international federation of communities with, uh, for people with developmental disabilities. Here's what he writes. Welcome is one of the signs that a community is alive. To invite others to live with us is a sign that we aren't afraid, that we have a treasure of truth and of peace to share. A community which refuses to welcome, whether through fear, weariness, insecurity, a desire to cling to comfort, or just because it is fed up with visitors, is dying spiritually. I grew up in a home that took hospitality very, very seriously. Some of you will know that uh, I am a pastor's kid, and I remember sometimes in the evening coming upon my parents making strategic lists of people who they were determined to have in our home. And a particular focus was made on people who weren't always getting invitations to other people's house, and their eyes were always peeled for people who were new. I would guess that on an average week, I would have people around my table two to four times a week. And the most common question on Sundays for my mom was, who's coming over today? It was almost disappointing for us if we had to eat dinner by ourselves on Sunday afternoon. 
Now, I'm not saying that my parents' practice is like the gold standard and that everyone needs to live up to that. But what I have noticed as I've grown older, as the pace of society has picked up, I know that it's hard to keep an open door to my own home as I've grown up and my responsibilities in the world have increased. And that's why I think this text preaches to me and I suspect many of you this morning. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Now, the news about us I don't think is all bad. On the encouraging side, I hear often stories from many of you who are now a part of us, who are now part of this body, and you often, uh, when I ask, how did you come to be a part of this church, very often you will talk about how someone specific, maybe a past leader, maybe someone you happened to sit by on Sunday morning, how they took an interest in you while you were still a stranger to us. So many of you who are here, part of this church this morning, you are here because at one time you were a stranger and someone took the time to welcome you in. And I want uh, this morning, uh, and kind of as a positive reinforcement, for you to hear one of those stories that comes from way back in our church history. Uh, I want to invite an old friend. He's getting older. He's getting close to 50 years old, which seems crazy to me. But would you help me welcome uh, someone who grew up in this church, uh, a guy by the name of James Wheeler. And I'm going to invite Mike along with him, and you'll find out why soon. Please welcome James. (laughs) This one's good. This is yours, James. <clears throat> and Mike, I'll give you one too. So uh, there's a mic beside you there, Mike, that's yours. James, this can be yours. Uh, James currently serves as the site pastor for Southview Church of their Imago Dei campus, campus uh, which uh, you can ask him what that means. It's like Latin words. It's too fancy for me. Uh, but James uh, grew up in this church family in the 80s. Actually, I have a picture of him uh, from back in the day. He is the super happy guy uh, in the middle of the picture. Some of you will recognize someone else who is here this morning. Gary, Gary, can you stand up? There, this is Gary Friesen. Gary was like the leader of the youth group there. I, Gary, everyone needs to see you. It's, this is tw- 20 years old. Look at this guy. It's the exact same guy. I'm blown away that he wore a tie to youth group. (laughs) So, uh, James, I don't want to take a long time to, like, bridge from what I've been talking about to your story, but uh, I know uh, from past conversations that we've had um, that you were deeply impacted by the hospitality of people in this church when you were growing up uh, in the 80s. And uh, I think, if I'm not stretching it too much, that hospitality may have even played a role in you coming to know Jesus more personally. So can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Well, first let me say it's a real delight to be here this morning and a real privilege given my experience with the church in the past and and just good good season of life uh, that was for me as I connected with Cochrane Alliance. I came... I started participating in this community because um, I was precipitated by a death in the family. My dad had passed away, and my mom had made friends with uh, a lady named Lindy Vincent. Um, And so mom started coming to Cochrane Alliance. We used to meet in the high school. Uh, That was interesting. Um, To sing worship hymns while you look at a giant cobra snake was kind of an interesting thing. Um, But... uh, uh, in that experience, you know, I remember my mom was kind of formal. She made me wear a, a kind of a blue blazer and, and gray dress pants. So I probably looked like a real stranger in the church. <laughs> I probably looked kind of odd. Um, but I was afraid. You know, it was, it was scary uh, as a 12-year-old kid to kind of come into a totally new place. Uh, and, and songs and singing and kind of all this Christian stuff. And... Uh, and so that was a scary experience. One of, the, one of the first things that was neat as I started to get to know people a little bit and, and still feeling very cautious was we had this uh, Sunday school teacher named Karen Coop back in the day. And she was kind of like one of your classic, cool, young adults. And uh, I remember she put her arm around me one Sunday after I'd been there for probably a couple months. 
um, and still feeling pretty shy and nervous. But she just put her arm around me and, and, uh, and she just told me she loved me. Um, and that was just something really, uh, really powerful for me as a, a stranger, an outsider, to feel that kind of welcome, and that greeting. Of course, I was probably 13 at the time, so my emotionally mature response was, I know. <laughs> uh, <coughs> But it was, a, you know, it was the starting of kind of a, a sense of letting defenses down as a stranger coming in and feeling welcomed. And then that followed with, for me, I think, really unique in my own experience was just being completely embraced by a church community, coming out of a broken home and some difficult experiences. And I, as I thought about this, <clears throat> excuse me, the other day, uh, just so many names and people came to mind uh, who... So what happened on Sundays was great, but hospitality for me was m many times what was happening outside of Sundays. Uh, you know, people inviting me to their homes. Many of the men in the church invited me over to work for them, so I was maybe kind of child labor or something, I'm not <laughs> sure. I remember shoveling horse poop into a field for uh, one guy and chopping wood and cleaning a shop, Dave Gurry's shop. and. And just different, but it was a way that the community and my brokenness and my being strange and left out and abandoned, the community just said, hey, there's ways we can embrace this individual. Uh, and that is the gospel. So. Okay, we, I'm talking into this like it's my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> We could, we could stop there, James, but uh, I understand that in your later teen years, you actually moved in with some people uh, from the church for a season. Uh, what happened in that, and how did that impact you? Well, yeah, uh, so hospitality was amazing all the way along. When I graduated from high school, I actually, in kind of an odd, it was an odd story, I, I needed to move out of my home, and so the school librarian, I basically moved into her place and I rented a room and whatever. It was like, a, so it was kind of an awkward thing. Um, and uh, there was a guy, a family in the community, Mike's parents, Marvin Grace, who I think, you know, probably thought that wasn't the hottest setup for me. And so Marv uh, made an offer and just said, hey, you know, you could, you could come and I need somebody to, you know, more slave labor, I need someone to work for me. Uh, and so, uh, he invited me into their home to be part of their family. Uh, and that, you know, the potters are, um, when you, for me, when I think of hospitality, I, I simply can think of Mike's folks. Because that was, for me, my personal experience was being welcomed by them into their family. So it wasn't just a place to stay and kind of, you know, just a, it was, I was welcomed into the family. So when there's family meals or, or events or whatever stuff was going on, it wasn't that I was kind of a separate person renting a room or anything. I was in some ways a potker uh, for four, four summers as I worked with Marv. Um, and it wasn't always easy. One of the summers, we, there were some issues. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I backed the work van into a big pole, which didn't really go over for some reason. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, so sometimes there's bumpy moments um, when you're hospitable. It's not all kind of a hallmark moment. There's unhallmarky moments in there. Uh, but again, to be welcome, I don't think at the time I understood what I was being offered even, like the grace and mercy. And, uh, and so it was amazing. And so that, that was such a blessing to me. And when I went to Bible college, I had this little thing. Um, and Mike knows this too, when we went to school, kids would get like, in those days when you went to Canadian Bible College, you get like little care packages or like letters from home or whatever. When we were at Bible College, we would get giant boxes. And all the other guys who were there were like, what is, like, give me a break. I wish I was part of your church. You know, so it's just that hospitality and grace, even when, for me, when we left, Community, it just, it's just amazing. Okay, 
So Mike, uh, you were in junior high when James uh, got invited into your home. Um, how did this experience uh, affect you and how does your parents' example affect you even today? Well, it's st- I think in junior high, you don't really have the brain capacity, or at least I didn't, to really process what was going on. But having grown up in a family with four kids and, and, a, and a, a, an extra brother, and then now being a parent of three teenagers, um, one of the things that uh, I've come to learn about family life is that maybe the, one of the best metaphors for family life is the Hunger Games. Okay. It's, it's chaotic. It can be dangerous. And, and, um, and that's life. Anybody, anybody, who, anybody who's in a family can relate to fa- how crazy family life can be. And so when I, th- when I think about hospitality, it's not for the faint of heart if you're going to do it right. Um, your, 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 your veneer, your Martha Stewart image, um, if, if, your, if your goal is to be hospitable and maintain your Martha Stewart uh, way of life, um, you're going you're gonna to fall on your face fast. And, and true hospitality means being vulnerable and means opening up your life and welcoming people into your lives. So, and I say that it's not for the faint of heart, and, and I don't say that to scare you away because you get so much um, as a result of doing it right. Um, because of my parents being hospitable, I found my best friend. <laughs> this has been a, um, James's relationship, my, my relationship with James has shaped my life. And um, it, it started with hospitality, that, uh, uh, an expression of hospitality that I had no control over as a, as a junior higher. So you never know what you're gonna get out of it. Um, another thing that I got out of it was a, an example. Um, my parents have shaped my life in so many ways, and, and this hospitable thing is, is a way that uh, has kind of seeped into the DNA of my family. Um, and uh, we, we, we seek to embody this just intuitively sometimes. And it's interesting because a few years ago, um, this family uh, of, uh, it was uh, two girls and a single dad. They moved in a few doors down from us in Montreal. And um, they quick, the girls quickly became my, one of my daughter's best friends. And um, it's just neat how, how God works because we just wanted, we would try to be welcoming, try to make our place a house, a, a welcoming place uh, for our kids to bring their friends. And it's neat how through over the years, that, that friendship between my daughter and those girls have, have uh, really um, deepened. And the neat thing is, is uh, we found out this fall that um, uh, the oldest daughter, uh, the oldest girl, she, uh, she bought a one-way ticket for Calgary. She'll be here in January. And uh, she's going to be move, moving in with us. So <laughs> that could be an adventure for, for all of us. Uh, another chapter in the Hunger Games. Uh, <laughs> I hope not. But... Uh, but it's, uh, it, again, um, the only reason why I have the guts to even try this is because um, my parents modeled it for me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> I want to conclude by pigging, piggybacking on one of Mike's observations. And I want to ask a question that may seem strange at first. Who will lose out the most if we neglect hospitality? Who suffers if we keep the doors of our lives and our church closed, or at least not as open as they could be? I think the answer is what makes Christian hospitality so surprising? Let's go back to verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. 
That is kind of a weird thing to say, don't you think? Most biblical scholars think that this is a subtle reference to a story about Abraham in the book of Genesis. The story is told in Genesis 18 that when he is already a very old man, Abraham is hanging out in the shade on a hot day by his tent one afternoon. And three guys come walking by on their way to the city of Sodom. Jewish tradition is that the three guys are actually angels, even though scripture doesn't explicitly say whether they are angels and there's some interesting conversational dynamics that makes you wonder if Abraham is talking to a guy or if he's talking directly to God. Abraham invites these three guys for lunch and they stay. And while they're eating through these people, God gives Abraham a message that he and Sarah are going to have a baby within a year's time. Both Abraham and Sarah think that's a joke at first, but God is very serious, and Abraham's act of hospitality to three strangers becomes the setting for probably the biggest blessing of his life. So when the writer of Hebrews hints at this story, he's telling us that when we show hospitality, we might be surprised by what happens when we interact with strangers, that our hospitality might open the door to miracle, that the people who experience our hospitality could actually turn out to be messengers of God to us. The blessing our guests give may be greater than the blessing they receive from us. If you were to talk to my parents, they will probably not tell you very much about all the good they did for people who sat around their table or stayed in our home. But they will tell you how people who were once strangers in their life are now lifelong friends who have enriched our lives immensely. People who serve the poor, the outcast, the broken, those people who serve will tell you that they are, and not the ones they served are the, are the biggest winners in the relationship. But I think there is a deeper layer still to to Hebrews chapter 13. It has to do, I think, this deeper layer with a picture that Jesus gives us of the end of time. And you can find it in Matthew chapter 25. And if you thought that hospitality does not have surprising consequences, then perhaps you ought to think again. And I'm just going to read just like I find it here in Matthew 25. We're going to start at verse 31. When the Son of Man, this is Jesus talking, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of these, the least of my brothers, you did it to me. There's a little Presbyterian university in Spokane called Whitworth College, and one of Whitworth's past presidents is a guy by the name of Bill Robinson. And Bill says that he learned one of the most important lessons of his life when the first time he visited a state prison in Stillwater, Minnesota. He said as he got through security uh, and got up to the prison chaplain, the chaplain took him aside and said, always remember Bill as you're coming to this prison that if Matthew 25 is right, you didn't come to bring Jesus to these guys, you came to find him. 
surprise. And you thought you were just welcoming people into your life. You actually got to host Jesus himself. My friends, we sing a lot of songs in this room that make very lofty promises to Jesus. We say that we're gonna continue to sing his praises even while we are on our deathbeds. We say in our songs that we will go to the furthest reaches of the world for his name, that we will sacrifice all we have and all we are for the cause of Christ. These songs, no doubt, and these lyrics are good things to say and I affirm them all. But in Matthew 25 and Hebrews 13, Jesus shows us that we don't need to take such drastic measures to love and worship him. We just need to open the door of our lives a little and we'll have all kinds of opportunity to serve him directly. The fourth century preacher John Chrysostom put it this way. It's not, I was sick and you healed me. It's, I was sick and you cared for me. It's not, I was a stranger and you adopted me. It's, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. It's not, I was in prison and you freed me. It was, I was in prison and you visited me. Care, welcome, visitation, hospitality, Can we do that? Well, then we might be surprised at how we will meet Jesus in the coming days. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we would start by um, recognizing that we are welcome at your table. We're not celebrating communion today, but it would be a really good exercise for us to remember the hospitality by which you invite us through your sacrifice to sit at your Father's table. And we thank you that although to your world you were a stranger, we didn't recognize you, we didn't open our homes and our lives for you, you still came, you still sacrificed your life for us, and as a result, we are looking forward to the day we are our, your Father welcomes us into our eternal home. And I pray in uh, 2014, in a, in a day of busyness and responsibilities and all kinds of stuff going on in our lives, that you would reactivate the reflex of Christian hospitality among us. We pray for our efforts to raise money, to, uh, to think about how we can use this building as a hospitable place in our community. I pray that you would help us see see fit to do that, that you would help us see this project through. But even more than that, I pray that you would help us have eyes and ears and homes and care for the people who are strangers among us, that they might not stay strangers, but they would be welcomed in to our family and that they might know you as well. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.